all you wealthy bosses to the Wealthy Boss Show. Today is a special episode because I am joined by a special guest, Laura Curry, and she is an expert at navigating difficult conversations, which is an incredible skill to have. So Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I'm glad to be having this conversation. There is so much that I know that I can learn from you and that wealthy bosses can as well. So just to, I mean, I know I mentioned in like a tiny little snippet of what you do, but in your own words, can you give us like the bird's eye view of, of what you do, what you're all about and what your strengths are? Sure, sure. So I, I work with women and in who are in high stress, high stakes fields, people who work in real estate, in, in the court system, as attorneys, nurses, emergency workers, who are really purpose-driven and who encounter a lot of people on their best and worst days. And so there's a lot mm-hmm. of difficult, just kind of in a, in a nutshell. Yeah. I help them kind of understand how to avoid those cringeworthy situations mm-hmm. and those soul-sucking feelings that they end yeah. up getting in difficult interactions and how to prepare for, understand, and get through them. Wow. And why is this so important to you? Because I feel like this type of skill set does not come necessarily easily or naturally. It sounds like it has a story behind it as to why it has become yeah. important to you. You know, I started out as an investigative journalist and I moved into the nonprofit field and was a private investigator. And wow. basically, I went from difficult to difficult to difficult. <laughs> And there was just real themes, you know, people were so defensive and mm-hmm. in their defensiveness, they could not be heard yeah. in their defensiveness. They could not hear others. And there were no mm-hmm. real connections being made. Yeah. And all we want is to connect and understand, yeah. you know, and find our people. Yeah. And so it just fascinated me, this disconnect and mm-hmm. the triggered reactions that people would have. Mm-hmm. And they didn't even understand themselves well enough or the basic triggers that most people right. have in this world. Yes. And frankly, right now, I think we're living in an extremely triggering time. <laughs> yes, yes. These are not um, benign times. They're, I feel like the, t- the times are loaded these days. Yes, it's absolutely even more critical now that we know how to have productive conflict. Um, I know myself personally, you know, I didn't have very much good practice with dealing with conflict as a child, as probably many of us have. Like I grew up in a family where where conflict was dealt with by avoiding it and and just mm-hmm. pretending, you know, just focusing on the good and presenting a good image. Um, and so, you know, that's a harder lesson to learn as an adult. And then, as you said, when you take on ambition, you know, ambitious careers and ambitious business, business practices, you kind of set yourself up, you know, whether you're working with a lot of clients or you're working, um, you know, in a, in a high profile situation, you you do often find that if the more you kind of want to accomplish in the world, the more you have to deal with conflict. So it's great yeah. to have someone like you that can can actually specialize in dealing with that so that we can be most effective in our work and in those ambitions for sure. So you have recently released a book, which I have right here for everyone that's watching the video version of this on the podcast. You can check out the video, but we will link to it in the show notes. So you just wrote a book all about how to not only handle difficult conversations, but to actually really to me, it seemed like more um, the, the general premise is understanding yourself first. So that then you can have that solid understanding of having productive conversations that might be you know, um, brought about as a result of conflict. Mm-hmm. So you talk in, in your book, you talk about what you call the reactionary life. Mm-hmm. And I, I think for you know, many of us who get, I don't know if anyone is good at conflict, but I think some of us maybe are more triggered by it or more scared of it than others. So I think probably for some of us, even just opening up the conversation around the need to communicate better can already feel like failure, like a shortcoming. And maybe that's just a reflection of my own natural <laughs> stance. <laughs> um, but the way that you describe the reactionary life um, is the result of surviving cumulative experiences and that the way we respond to triggers originally began as a strategy that served us in some capacity. So can you elaborate on that a little bit for our listeners? Sure, sure. You know, we are all unique, but with a theme. 
There is a part of us that reacts the same way in stressful situations. There are emotions that we're much more comfortable with. Mm -hmm. There are situations that we're more comfortable with. And we're accumulation of not only that, but our birth order, our love Mm -hmm. language, our Myers-Briggs. I could go on and on with all the different ways that we can get to know ourselves. But our reactionary stance is the first one we go to, the one that benefited us the most when we were growing up in difficult situations and in good situations. If you react in a certain way and your teacher or your parent responded positively and you got, you know, your ego got fed, which we all need. I mean, ego in the best sense of the word, not the negative sense of the word. Then those get cemented in us, those reactions, Mm -hmm. those reactionary stances. Okay. And so you talk about four distinct, again, you say everyone has unique combinations or unique, um, you know, niches within these, but you talk about four major themes or reactionary stances. Can you share with us our our listeners? Sure. So they manifest differently, like I said, Mm -hmm. with, with all the, with who you are at the core, but also they, they manifest actively and passively. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're in control or you, you have power in a situation, then you can kind of respond much more actively. Right. If you're unsure, you kind of react passively. Right. So the first one is like the innocent avoider. Those who actively avoid and mm-hmm. passively just are like, hey, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm, I'm going to get out of this situation, you know. Yeah. And there's a lot of people who do that. And frankly, each one of these is kind of hard to um, identify yourself because we use all of them in different ways. But we always have that one go to that mm-hmm. benefits us the most. And the next one is the fixer pleaser. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a recovering fixer pleaser myself. And it also manifests actively and passively as trying to to please everyone, to make sure everyone's happy or to fix the situation or the problem, even when we're not asked to. Mm-hmm. So it can really get in the way. Yeah. And then we have the perfectionist controller who, again, actively tries to control their themselves mostly, but their environment as well yeah. Yeah. and want things to be perfect. They can yeah. control the external. Right. And then the most difficult one to break free from is the victim blamer, mm-hmm. because there's always something to rail against. There's always an injustice. And who doesn't feel sorry for themselves sometimes? But if you get stuck into that, that can be really hard to break free from. Yeah, got it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And I definitely, I think, resonated more with the controller perfectionistic. But I think as a result of more so it manifests in like me wanting to control myself personally, like, I don't feel like I'm like bossy or need to control like where we go to dinner or anything like that. But right. sure, I definitely resonated most with that one. So I thought it was kind of interesting that you, that you say that these are accumulation of person, like nature and nurture. So our mm-hmm. you know, personalities, it's not just our personality. It's, it's a combination of that, a combination of how we grew up, the circumstances that, that helped shape and mold us. Do do you believe that our stances can change over time or do you feel like one, one of us is, one of them is pretty much always going to represent how we carry on in the life? You know, I think we all will have our comfort one, but mm-hmm. our stances can be positive. They can work yeah. for us. It's right. uh, like my grandma used to say, everything in moderation, including moderation. You know? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's, it's good to control and to have high standards for yourself. It's nice to be a pleaser and to help people with their problems. Yeah. But, you know, your greatest weakness is your strength overplayed. And mm-hmm. so if you're unaware of what's going on with you and what your stance is, what your tendencies mm-hmm. are, then you can't identify when it's happening and when you're on the wrong side of the net. You know, when you're playing mm. in someone else's yard, you, yeah. it really is more about self-awareness. And once you start to see it play out in your world, mm-hmm. you'll go, oh, you know what? I really want to help them. They didn't ask me. I'll <laughs> offer. But if not, I got to stay on my side of the net. <laughs> right. I like that. That's really, that's really good. So what would you say to those who, again, this might be more stance specific, I'm not sure, but who either consciously or subconsciously believe that if they do everything right in the first place, if they're perfect Mm -hmm. communicators and they play by the rules and they're extremely aware and, um, you know, sensitive, that they won't ever experience conflict. Yeah. And that would work 100% of the time if we were alone on the planet. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Because the truth of the matter is that we can only control ourselves 
and we can only control our actions and reactions and interactions. Mm -hmm. And we all have our own journey on this, you know, on figuring out who we are and what our place is. And when you come across someone else who feels threatened or that you have triggered in some way that might even have nothing to do with you, you know, maybe they don't right. like short blondes, you know, maybe. <laughs> Right, you never know. It could also be the verbal, you know, where the words that they say, the physical surroundings. It could be where, you know, how they came to that situation that day. There's so many kind of correlating factors that you can only know what your true intention is, yes. what your best case scenario for that interaction is, what your right. worst case scenario is, and when to get the heck out of there. <laughs> That's really helpful. That really clears, like, clears up some, I think, ownership around that. It, and and I definitely can be the one that falls prey to, well, if I just did everything right, would never be happy with me. And then that, then you just fall so much harder when you set that type of, like, expectation up for yourself. So that's a, a great way of kind of um, outlining it. Yeah. yeah, so you talk about how emotions impact us physically. And I 100% agree as even a you know, fitness expert and someone who's aware of the body's physical processes. You know, I always think it's, I've become to think to, of the opinion that it's kind of a misnomer to talk about like the mind-body connection because the mind is part of the body, right? Like there is no distinction of the body and, or the, the mind and the brain and our state of emotional being. Like none of that is separate from our body. It's all happening within the realm of the physical experience so you talk about how specific emotions manifest themselves physically so how does awareness of those physical characteristics that come about as a result of certain emotion help us identify when we're being triggered and then I guess more importantly figure out what to do with those emotions then yeah, I, you know, I'm Irish, so I am a huge <laughs> Oh, me too. <laughs> oh, that's where it comes from. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, got, I put humor up front and I stuff the rest of that down. But, you know, when you're aware of your own body, just the breathing, like you talked about on uh, the podcast two weeks ago, or how your stress shows up. So I'm a big teeth grinder. And if yeah. I wake up in the morning and my jaw really hurts, it's like, all right, Laura, what are you chewing on? What are you not dealing with in your life that you need to address? When my neck and shoulders really hurt, it's like, what burden am I carrying around? Mm -hmm. It's like Western medicine forgot all about the connection <laughs> between right. the mind and the body. And we're just reawakening to that. Yes. That's where all those phrases, you know, shouldering a burden or mm -hmm. pain in the neck or, you know, where they carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So once I know that I start to, for me, it's my shoulders start to rise up by my ears. And it's like, uh -huh. okay, yeah. I need to take a break. I got to sit down and figure out what I need to do first. What's too much? What What's overwhelming me? Because mm -hmm. otherwise, it will just manifest in me physically. And my body will say, all right, you're going to have to take a break. I will now make right. you sick. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I will make sure you take the break you need. Right. I've heard some meditation experts refer to that as like our stress signature. So oh. identifying places in our body where we tend to carry the most stress. And you're right, it is different for people. For me, it's it's always right behind, like between my shoulder blades and in the like the shoulder area where I carry a lot of tension and sometimes I have tightness in my belly when I'm feeling anxious. Do you have mm -hmm. recommendations on people just pulling into that? Because often we carry these around and we're not even aware of them. So mm -hmm. we don't understand how much they're weighing us down. So do you have any like practical pointers for people to identify these and, and actually recognize when that's going on in their body? And then if so, is it, you know, is it that they need to take a break? Is it that they need to become introspective and, and start to ID what's going on? What are some, or are there some physical um, kind of overrides that we can, can practice them? to compensate for that feeling that we have in our bodies. Yeah, Mariah, I love this question. Because for me, I think that after is where all the all the understanding and healing happens. Mm -hmm. So when when you, you know, like when you're like, oh, I got to get a massage, this is it, I can't mm -hmm. take this physical burden anymore. Yeah. And you go in, so that's when you need to start really taking a look at it and saying, mm -hmm. okay, what led up to that? What did the two weeks before that look like? What was I dealing with? What feelings were I feeling? You, you start with the after, and then you start to prepare for the before. 
Okay. okay, so the last time I had all my bills due and I had mm-hmm. podcasts to get out and it was the end of the year and Christmas or, you know, right. whatever that is, I started to notice it physically. So yes. then you prepare for that mm-hmm. and then you are ready for the during so that once you start to feel that you're like, okay, I know I got a million things on my plate, but I need to take a half hour for a walk mm-hmm. or I need to do some deep breathing mm-hmm. or I need to just go get some fresh air and a cup of coffee or stretch, whatever it is for you that helps you release that tension. So I think if you look back, you can move forward. Yeah, that's helpful, especially as you, like you said, are we tend to wear these things the same way that might be unique to each of us. But the more that we can start to clue into that, we'll find those patterns and we'll see where those stress signatures arise and what we can do to Mm -hmm. what we can do about it. So in your coaching work, um, right, you do, I know you're an author and then you do private coaching too as well, right? Yeah, I do. I do one-on-one coaching. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So in that coaching work, you specialize in helping, you know, as you said, um, ambitious entrepreneurs and career professionals have better interactions with their clients, which is interesting because I typically, I, I think typically when I think of like conflict resolution, you, all, you always jump to the personal because it feels like such a personal thing. But I think that's so interesting to talk about how it's showing up in our professional lives. And yeah. I mean, I know for myself, I bring that professional stuff home with me for sure. You know, I during my in my day job, I run a um, Pilates studio, so we've got 220 members to keep happy, and if one of them screams at me because they didn't like our cancellation policy. You know, I bring that that in with me, so I definitely understand the need for it. But mm-hmm. can you share more because you've got such a comprehensive understanding of how this plays out in our professional lives? Why do you think it's important for entrepreneurs to improve their communication skills with the ones that they serve? Yeah, you know, it is critical in this time because triggers are the bully's weapons these days. Mm -hmm. And we are living in such a reactionary time Mm -hmm. that when you don't understand when you're triggering your clients or how you react when your clients trigger you, it can cost you time, money, energy and it sits in you physically. I mean, who yes. hasn't taken, like you say, you take some, you know, what if a client is upset? And and when you don't know what happened or why it happened, mm-hmm. then you can't navigate through it and and fix it. Now again, you can only control your own behavior. But if I know that one of my triggers is I never feel heard. I feel like people don't understand what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Then when someone reacts to me in a certain way and I start to get upset, it's like, okay, I'm not feeling heard. So right. what can I do to solve that problem? Yeah. Or when the client reacts in a certain way, mm-hmm. they're like, okay, this must be a trigger. We're talking about money. We're talking about right. bills due. Right. So that must be triggering my client. Mm-hmm. How can I speak to the feeling and mm-hmm. not the fact? Because mm-hmm. the feeling is something different. If, if I trigger, I, I had a client who um, didn't, she knew that her client was triggering her. She had no okay. idea that she was triggering her client. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. And as we like unpacked it and walked through it, she came to understand that her client had spent 25 years in the business and always felt like she had to prove herself. Like people okay. didn't believe that she was, you know, who she was and she had to defend who, you know, the, the skill set that she had. And she didn't realize that the way that she had asked for information and questions was triggering her to right. feel dumb, basically. Right. And so when you when she realized it and addressed that feeling within her client, they were able to kind of get to real communication, which is my wow. goal. Yeah. People to have real, deep, meaningful communications and connections. Right. Which is so, I think for many of us who are entrepreneurs particularly, we bring so much of ourselves into our business. We take care, we take everything we do personally because we're not just showing up and punching a time card, but you know, we build these entire practices or, or businesses or, um, you know, media based on what's important to us and our values. And so mm-hmm. I think the, the, proneness to be even more triggered when things go wrong or you know you have a difficult client interaction it can just be that much more intense when it's something that's so important to you and you have such a strong vision of how you want to carry it out um that's definitely definitely really important and and so prevalent on a day-to-day basis yeah and your reputation is important especially for i I work mostly with smaller businesses Mm -hmm. their reputation is everything And if they get a bad reputation, all it takes is one client who, Mm -hmm. even if you feel like you did the best, one client out there, you know, who was triggered and had a bad reaction. 
Right. So how do you overcome then when you have the one negative, the one negative Nelly and you've got 99 mm-hmm. happy customers and they're singing your praises and they think you're wonderful and you're only thinking about that one negative one. How do you kind of navigate yeah. that not to completely let that sit in you forever and focus on that negative, one negative encounter after you're out yeah. of thinking of really good ones? Yeah. You know, one of my favorite practices is for me to rewrite history. <laughs> so if I, I have a that. really <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Right. You know, I did it a lot while I was raising my kids, trust me. <laughs> you know, you react in a really bad way or you're like, God, I should have done that better. I really I missed this opportunity. Then write it down. Write down okay. where it went off the rails and rewrite oh, how you would have responded. Okay. Again, you can't control them. And if they're just yeah you know, jerks or bullies, there's nothing you can do about it, but you can keep your intention clear Mm -hmm. and be honest, but fair and, and firm, but understanding, you know, you can, you can be your true self and still navigate through that in a respectful way. And it still can go wrong, but you got to give yourself a break. For me personally, I give myself a good 15 minutes of (laughs) (laughs) self-pity. I love it. Because you don't get through that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I know sometimes it can be helpful too for myself if I get like a really snippy, and this shows up more in my day job, um, just because there's such a volume of, of people with expectations. <laughs> but I know I find it's really helpful. Like I had a really nasty email from a customer who knew the rules, knew the guidelines, um, but wanted me to buy to to break the rules for her, and had had really given me kind of an ultimatum and it's really easy to want to respond at the end of that Friday afternoon at 4 p.m. and you know, respond instantly to that email. I know this is the way it's going to be, but I was mm-hmm. like, nope, I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to deal with it on Monday. Let her calm down. Let me calm down and then be able to have a more, um, maybe more professional response than I would have preferred to in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and there are so many defensive people right now. Everyone's yes. So defensive and feeling attacked that yeah. when you look at, okay, what is their limiting self belief? What mm-hmm. is their negative self image that is making them attack right. in order to defend? It, you can kind of get a different perspective on how you may want to respond. For sure. And then it diffuses the, the ownership off, off of you. I and mean, the response is still yours, but it takes some of the, the triggers off yourself too, right? You yes. Everyone's fighting a battle. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how have, have, you personally, by applying some of these techniques, been able to lead a richer life, both in your business and in your personal life? You know, I really, I'm, I'm older now, but I spent so many years carrying burdens of everyone around me being a fixer mm-hmm. pleaser. Yeah, okay. And even worse, they were burdens no one wanted me to carry. I mean, mm-hmm. some of them were ones that mm-hmm. were put on me, but sure. in general, they didn't belong to me. And it stopped yeah. me from knowing myself in a way that I should have. Mm-hmm. knowing my own intention, knowing what I wanted for this this world, and not being swayed to every emotion. I'm mm-hmm. an intuitive, and mm-hmm. sometimes I can feel the emotions, and it becomes overwhelming. But those don't belong to me. They're not my burden. And yeah. so within this work that I've done, and like I say, within the court system, and being mm-hmm. an investigator, and going through, I've seen how detrimental it can be in your life. And so as I implemented little changes... Noticing boundary breaches, strengthening my boundaries, understanding the purpose and the secret gift in every single emotion, Mm -hmm. understanding what my tendencies are, what my heritage emotions are. And what did you call, what did the woman say that it was her signature? um, Stress signature. Stress signature. I like that. Yeah. 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 You know, once you start to identify that, you can find a better way, find a different way and and find much more close and meaningful connections. And that is so, such an empowering message, which I think is, is the heart of many um, conflicts. The amount of fear and emotion around that is, mm-hmm. is a feeling or a message of being disempowered. And so that yes. brings such a feeling of empowerment to being able to do something better with the situation. Yeah, to speak your truth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> well, before we wrap up, I always like, because I like to, I love talking about the expertise and then I love um, asking about how these self-care routines show up in your personal life. So my background is in fitness and nutrition. So I love chatting about, um, obviously that's a big theme that we talk about in, in the wealthy boss show, but we talk about 
such a range of self-care. To me, self-care is very, very broad. And everyone defines it differently, but it's something that I think as entrepreneurs, we would do well to prioritize because we often put our own self-care off. Now, obviously, what you do on a professional basis is huge for being able to manage you know, an important component of our own emotional self-care. What are some other self-care practices or healthy habits, whether they're physical or mental or emotional or spiritual or all of the above, that mm-hmm. you adopt on a, ha- on a daily basis or on a regular basis to make sure that you are showing up, one, showing up the best way that you can in your business, and mm-hmm. two, actually enjoying that life that you worked so hard to create. Yeah, you know, I finally embraced the pendulum. (laughs) My life is consistently swinging. And so when I want to binge the crown and just do nothing else but sit in my jammies, I'm like, that's what I'm doing today. And I'm going to give myself grace to do that. When I want to work, you know, 14 hours a day, because that's where my brain's (laughs) at and I'm feeling my, you know, then I do that. But I give myself a a break to do that as long as I'm trying to get physical activity or leave the house and get some fresh air once a day. And then my guilty pleasure is a massage. Uh, I actually just came from a massage. Oh, mine too. You know, you're going to laugh at this. I don't know if I've actually shared this on air before. So one of my mentors, when I was in college, she was like, you should I guess you call them manifestations, like little alarms that pop up now and then like, congratulations on all the leads and you're one month closer to blah, 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 like reaching this milestone in your business. Well, yeah. one of them, one of the goals that I've set for myself is to get a massage every week. Oh, <laughs> so, I <love> that. <laughs> so every Friday afternoon, I set a little alarm that reminds me, it pops on my phone. Time for your, at 4 p.m., time for your weekly massage, which, you know, I only get one like once every month or two, but that's my goal. So I'm like putting that out in the universe. So I, I like definitely, it. definitely am on par with that. <laughs> and I love to manifest because the more you think it, it you bring it into your environment. So yeah. you'll be getting that once a week massage soon. <laughs> and I'll be tweeting about it. <laughs> Laura, where can people soak up more of your wisdom if they're interested in, in learning more about how to deal positively with difficult emotions, they're interested in working one-on-one with you, what would be some of the next steps for them to get to absorb all of your good work? Great. Well, they can go to my website. Of course, my name is not easily spelled. It is L-A-R-A-C-U-R-R-I-E. So laracurry.com. And you can book a breakthrough one-on-one strategy session with me, which is totally free. We can see how or if it's good to work together. I have a ton of free resources and videos on there and a series on the secret gifts and every emotion. I'm on Facebook and Instagram and all that good stuff. So they can reach out to me there. And, oh, I have a a book for one of your viewers. So if, um, if you'd like to give this away to one of your listeners, then I would love to send it on. And that's a great place to start. And that's on Amazon and my website. Yeah. And it's an easy read too. So I, I am usually, I told, warned you I'm a really slow reader, but it's an easy read. And even though it's a diff, you know, it's a heavy conversation, a heavy topic, you handle it with such a light touch and such a gracious touch. It's not, um, thank you. It's thank very, you. very consumable. Yeah. <laughs> so, Again, the Irish, I like to look with, with a sense of humor. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, well, Laura, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and I can't wait for Wealthy Bosses to learn even more about what you teach. It's so important now more than ever. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Mariah. This was a great pleasure. Bye. <laughs>